Good morning and welcome to Crossroads with George Cavour. So good to welcome each and every one of you this beautiful morning, an important day today in the history of the United States. It's our election day and we covet your prayers that our nation will choose a person of God's choice. We need to be praying that the Lord will bring the person of God's choice to lead this nation into the future. Morning, Victor. Morning, Carol. Good to see you. This morning I have a very long-standing and dear friend of mine, Dr. Sunil Gokavi. And uh, his son Jason and daughter-in-law Victoria and granddaughter Emily have come down from New York to be with me for the next few days. I'm hoping to have a chat with Sunil after this morning's crossroads and I hope that you will uh, uh, hang on and give me a 10 minute break and then we'll come together and have a nice conversation. Uh, God has wonderful plans for each one of our lives. And I knew Sunil when he was a 15 or 16 year old boy. And uh, today uh, he has been serving God in India as a medical mission hospital in, um, in Roxhall. And then as the executive director of the Emanuel Hospital Association in Delhi. Uh, hi, uh, Carol and Carl, great to have you with us this morning. Uh, I pray that the Lord will bless all of us as we come to the foot of the cross. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, and we thank you that you love us and you care for us. We thank you, dear Lord, for this country in which we live. Uh, we pray for all American citizens that they will exercise their franchise and vote for the person of your calling. Now guide and lead us, we pray, and help us uh, and bless this country. And we thank you for your faithfulness to those who live here. We pray for the countries of the world, that there will be true freedoms and that men and women will be uh, treated with equality of opportunities, that they would be given the uh, dignity that is inherent in the fact that they're made in the image of God. And I pray, Lord, that you will bless each one of us this morning, and we pray for peace in the land, that there would be no violence, and everything would be done peacefully. For we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Got to have a bit of Indian coffee to keep me going. A lot of my friends ask me, what's so special about Indian coffee? What is special is that we add chicory to it. And chicory takes off that sharpness in the strong Colombian and other coffees. It's a smoother coffee and those of us who grew up in India much prefer Indian coffee over any other coffee because we are so used to having that tiny proportion of chicory that smoothens our coffee. So there you go. You know the difference between Indian coffee and all other coffees. Did you know that, Susanil? <laughs> I just knew the word chicory, but I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> so it's so good to be here this morning. It's quite cold outside. Uh, the sky is uh, not bright and sunny as it normally is, but it, nor is it overcast. And I'm hoping that uh, we will not be having rain today. So Neil, I don't know if you can see there's an eagle on that tree. Um, and uh, it, it's spectacular as you sit outside and to see the wildlife all around us. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, God is good all the time. All the time, 
God is good. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Acts, Acts of the Apostles. We're turning to chapter 6, and uh, we're going to see how the early church dealt with the whole issue of elections. What were some of the guiding principles in choosing people for responsibilities in the life of the church? And I thought this might be pertinent and relevant as we think about what the United States is going to be participating in from this morning onwards. We're talking about the early church, the expansion of the early church, and the growth of the early church, and the teachings of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Dr. Luke writes in Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to verse 7, In those days, when the numbers of disciples were increasing, the Hellenistic Jews amongst them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would be not right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men amongst you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Praise God for these extraordinary events that characterize the earliest Christian community in Jerusalem. Now, I need to help Christians recognize that you cannot impose biblical values and Christian understandings of the world and life upon those who are not Christians. That is why here in the United States, there is a clear separation of church from state. Christians often make this terrible mistake of expecting Christian standards from non-Christians. My brothers and sisters, for heaven's sake, expect those Christian standards from those who come to our churches. Don't expect them from people who don't believe in Jesus Christ and who don't come to church. So the first thing that you, you and I are called to do is to appreciate that those of us who choose to respond to the gracious call of Jesus to follow him, must respond to him. And Jesus in John's Gospel, chapter 15, says, If you love me, you will obey my teaching. Obedience is the expression of love and gratitude. It is not a legal obligation. It is a response of gratitude and a response to overwhelming love. If you love me, you will obey my commands. Jesus didn't ask those who did not know him or those who did not love him to obey his commands. It's ridiculous. And equally, we Christians need to be clear in terms of our categories. What is true in church cannot be true of the world. And you cannot expect the world to uphold biblical standards. Do you understand what I'm saying? Morning, Gunver. I hope that you are well. And I hope that you and your husband 
Uh, well, my best wishes to both of you. So, dear brothers and sisters, be clear that when we are disciples of Jesus, we are thoughtful. We are thinking men, women, and children. And we exercise our decisions based on biblical values, a biblical vision, and we seek to obey Jesus Christ, not because of any legal duty, but because Jesus loved us. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Why? Because he first loved me. Always remember that our love of God is a response to the overwhelming experience of knowing that God loves us. And it is God who takes the initiative. It is Jesus who comes to us and says to us, follow him. We don't become Christians because we are born into a Christian home. All we have when we are born into a Christian home is an opportunity to be exposed to the truths of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has no grandchildren. He only has children. So we've got to make our own choices to respond to the love of God in Christ Jesus. And when Jesus says, follow me, we respond to that invitation. But remember, you don't blindly follow Jesus. You don't leave your brains behind. A lot of Christians leave their brains outside the church when they come to worship God. No, my brothers and sisters, our brains were part of who we are. We are called to use our brains. Paul writes in his letter to the Romans, he says, Be ye transformed by the renewal of your minds. We have to come with our brains and our minds that have been completely indoctrinated by the values of the world. And we need to contrast the truths of God's word, the values of his kingdom, his vision for the world and for his kingdom in contrast to the world with its earthly values, its vision for itself. It's a corrupt vision. It's a broken vision, and it will not help you. And that is why when we study the two worldviews, we understand and appreciate the values and the inherent principles embedded in these values. We choose to respond to God's values. We choose to obey the teachings of our Lord Jesus because he illumines our way. The Bible teaches us that his word is a lamp unto our feet. It gives us guidance. Jesus leads us, helps us to manage the complexities of life, the dilemmas of life. And we are therefore called to use our minds judiciously. Are you with me? It's so important to know that we have to think. We have to trust in the Lord. We have to put our faith in God and obey Him. And then you will see the work of God being amplified and made real in our lives and the lives of those around us. So we are now looking at a vision of the early church. Historically, it is in growth mode. It's in expansion mode. It's exploding. The gospel of Jesus is truly good news. People are responding to good news. Are you a good news person? Has the good news positively impacted your life? Because if it has, it will be an attractive life. It will be a life that is invitational. It will be a life that is hospitable. It will be a life that is generous. 
and people will want a piece of that. Most people, when they see church, they see a bunch of constipated people looking miserable. I keep asking Christians, and when I speak in churches around the world, what's wrong with you? Which acting school did you all go to where you've learned to develop such sour puss faces? You look miserable. Have mercy on me because I'm looking at your faces. For heaven's sake, remember the joy of the Lord is our strength. Are you happy today? Well, why don't you tell your face that? Somehow, your inherent happiness has not been conveyed to the facial muscles. We need to be joyful. And when we are joyful, our personalities will assume the joy of the Lord. You understand what I'm saying? Lots of people always tell me, George, you're always smiling. I can't help it. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Praise the Lord. Is the joy of the Lord your strength? You know, <clears throat> I am so excited, super excited, because God is real. And He has something so important for all of us. It's called life. This phenomenon of life is bracketed by birth and death. Birth and death, you have no control over. You have no choice in the matter. But you have responsibility and choices to make with this phenomenon called life. And God will hold us accountable for the way we use his gift of life. Are you with me? And so the way we live, the way we organize ourselves, the way we arrange society is vitally important because they all express our core values, our core beliefs. And that is why I thought on election day it's important for us as Christians to understand what some of our core beliefs are. When the church is in expansion mode, everybody is super excited, everybody is happy, and the people are coming to faith. They are so excited that they have been set free from the consequences and the power of sin over their lives. They have this incredible sense of euphoria, of another chance. Yes, another chance. Yes, another chance. God gives us another chance. And at elections, we are being given another chance. Let's exercise our franchise judiciously, thoughtfully, prayerfully, guided by the Holy Spirit, following biblical values for our lives. You can't expect that of the rest of the nation, but for the church to be a potent force in society, we are called to be the salt of the earth the light of the world, the aroma of Christ. We are called to be thermostats, not thermometers or barometers. We don't register the values of the world. We actually regulate the values of the world in our small corners of influence. So in this period of growth, we are beginning to see that the church from its very inception is multi-ethnic, multilingual. Look, on the day of Pentecost, there were Arabs there, there were Greeks there, there were Parthians there, there were Persians there. That is the earliest indication that the church was multinational, multi-ethnic, multicultural, and multilingual. And the church is growing. And one of its sociological realities is the demographics are changing. And there are tensions between people of diverse ethnic groups. The Hellenistic Jews were complaining against the Hebraic Jews. What are we talking about? The Jews that had gone to work in the Greco-Roman world were referred to as the Hellenistic Jews. The word Hellenistic simply means Greeks. 
the, they had gone into the Greco-Roman world as entrepreneurs, as businessmen, and the Jews are superb entrepreneurs. They are superb businessmen, and they're traders. They go all over the world. Their networks are second to none. Possibly the Chinese and the Indians are the only ones giving them a run for their money. And any businessman knows that your credibility in the marketplace is entirely dependent on your reputation, your word. Business is run on trust. Business can only be conducted in trust. And this is the re the reason is this truth is exemplified from the character of God. Within the Godhead, there's complete unity of heart, mind, and will, unity of purpose, and they work in concert because they trust each other. They develop each other, they delegate to each other, and they support each other. A nation that's divided will perish. The Bible teaches us that. We need to be united. We need to be reconciled. And the earliest church was facing the challenge of demography. The peoples were changing. There were Jews that came from the Greco-Roman world. And they were cosmopolitan. They were modern as opposed to the Jews that were born and raised in Jerusalem. Jerusalem had developed a character of its own. It was monoethnic, it was monocultural, it was monolingual. It was pyramidical as a society, hierarchical, and had over centuries developed rigid ways of functioning. Whereas the early church was expanding and growing. New wine cannot be contained in old wineskins. Do you understand what it means? When new opportunities come, your structures, your modalities need to adapt and change. Otherwise, you'll get left behind. You'll be part of yesterday's people. And the Church of Jesus Christ is growing. There were people from other cultures. And wait for it. Wait for the Apostle Paul to come. Because he will now intentionally take the gospel to the Gentiles. That means you and me. People from the non-Jewish diaspora. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news to all people. You and I are responding to God's good news in Jesus Christ. So on election day, we are anticipating good news. We are wanting a change. We are looking for new things. But there was something that was affecting the early church. It was inequality of opportunities. It was ethnic tensions between the Greco-Roman Hellenistic Jews with the Jerusalem-based Hebraic Jews. Clash of worldviews. Clash of values. And these are people who have responded to Jesus. They are people who have come to faith in the Lord Jesus. And yet, these old values can come in the way and restrict our ways of functioning. And so they have a complaint. The Hellenistic Jews come to the apostles and say, look, we thought we are all one. We are a, a redeemed people. We are a people of the resurrection. We have found new life in Jesus Christ. But guess what? It's the old values. I look after my own people. And the problem is that the power resides in the homeboys. It's the Jerusalem Jews who called the shots because they were born and raised there. And these Hellenistic Jews who have come to the uh, temple to pay their homages, they heard the message of Jesus, they've responded, they've been incorporated into the life of the church, but they are facing discrimination. 
they are facing inequality and they are facing injustice. Why? Because those who have power can control the destiny of the whole and it is the majority and it's the tyranny of the majority not the not the liberation of the truth but the tyranny of the majority that is why democracy at one level is not the answer to man's problems democracy gives all of us a vote but it all depends on how our vote is cast are we exercising our franchise in the light of God's kingdom values otherwise the way you cast your vote is just like a non-Christian I hope you understand what I'm saying the Jerusalem Jews are making sure that all the charitable giving is confined and restricted primarily to their people and the Hellenistic Jews the outsiders are treated like outsiders and are given the crumbs so they bring this management issue to the apostles who was the board of directors of the early church you know there is management even in the life of the church that's what we mean by the word stewardship in the book of Genesis God gives Adam management of the earth the responsibility of stewarding the resources of our planet and the leadership of the early church has the responsibility of managing the life and witness of the early church how can we offer the world a radical alternative that is attractive that is just that is fair that is life enhancing as opposed to an unjust system that is oppressive so the minority bring their petition to the board of directors the apostles and the apostles look at the crisis they recognize the validity of the the problem but they respond with very judicious thoughts the first thing is in terms of their own identity in terms of their own calling in terms of their calling their priority is to be focused in terms of their relationship with God by prayer and prayer is not just praying for other people but actually more so listening to God that is what prayer really is all about that's why we don't need to talk too much God already knows what's in our hearts he wants us to listen to him for heaven's sake why the dickens did God give us two years and only one mouth there must be some rationale for that but we contravene even our anatomy we speak too much we are called to listen to God and then to speak wisely to live wisely to act with justice so the first thing the disciples tell the assembled church is it would be wrong it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word in order to wait on tables what is the presenting issue the food that is being distributed is not fair people are sitting around tables and the food is brought to them so this is a separate ministry the ministry of waiting at tables essentially it's the ministry of that of a waiter if you ran a cafe or a restaurant and you were looking to employ people to be waiters at your restaurant 
I wonder how you would advertise. What would be things that you would look for? Let me suggest a few things. Wanted, honest people who are friendly, warm, relational. They got to be clean and hygienic. They got to be able to manage and to control and to regulate things in an orderly fashion. They got to be responsible. But let's look at what the early church looked for in those who were called to the ministry of attending to tables. The, and these were called deacons. Deacons are those who are exercising the practical matters of the church. Property. The management of our assets. And so let's look at what the apostles said. They said, brothers and sisters, choose seven men from amongst you. The word seven is a perfect number. Choose the right number of people. There's nothing magical about seven. What it means is choose the appropriate number of people, the right number of people. In this case, we'll choose seven. And make sure that they have a bath every day, that they wash their hands. No. Look at what the apostles say. They are full of the Spirit and are of wisdom. Isn't that strange? To serve food at tables, you need men and who are full of the Holy Spirit and who are wise. They are people who have a good reputation in society. They're thought highly because they are men who are filled with the Spirit. They manifest the fruits of the Spirit. And they are gifted in a variety of ways. Are we choosing the right people to exercise leadership in our land? Are they people of integrity? Are they people who love God and who are full of the Holy Spirit and who demonstrate the fruits of the Spirit, which are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, endurance, long-suffering. Find the candidate who exhibits these fruits of the Spirit. Be wary of people who boast, who are divisive. Choose people who you can trust. They must be people who live peaceable lives, whose lives are exemplary, whose lives are consistent and authentic. They walk the talk. Hand over this responsibility over to them. Look at verse three. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. We as apostles have a special calling to teach, to preach, and to listen to God even as we set up our time to be in prayer. We're told that this proposal pleased the whole group now I want you to look, to look at the words and the names of the people they chose. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenos, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. 
they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. What is significant by the names? They're all Greek and Gentile names. They're not Jewish names. Philip of Macedon, the father of the great Alexander the Great, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenos, Nicholas, all Greek sounding names. And in one case, Nicholas is, we are told, came from Antioch, which is Damascus, Syria. And he's a convert to Judaism. Who were the people complaining? They were the Hellenistic Jews. They were the outsiders. Who were the people they chose? They chose the minority. Isn't that incredible? They chose the people who had the complaints to distribute the assets to the whole. That is wisdom. It was a multi-ethnic team that had the responsibilities of listening to God and obeying God and being led by the Holy Spirit because they were filled with the Spirit, but they exercised good judgment because they were wise. The Bible teaches us that it is the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom. Fear in the Bible is clean. It's healthy. It's not a phobia. The word fear of the Lord could be better translated into English as those who are accountable to God. Those who recognize that they are accountable to God. They will have to give an account of their lives to God. Lord, have mercy on our nation. Lord, have mercy on our people. Lord, help us to choose the people who you want to lead our nation. I hope that you have heard the explanation of the Bible. It's the people who are the minorities, the people who feel that they are being unjustly treated. They are given privileges to address this grievous imbalance. My brothers and sisters, this is not the tyranny of the majority, but this is the way God works, fairly, with justice, with sensitivity to people's feelings, expectations, hopes. And those who are oppressed are being set free. That was the, the work of the Messiah. Good news is proclaimed to the poor. Freedom to captives. My brothers and sisters, on this election day, may we put our faith in God and learn to trust Him and to trust only in Him. I was thinking this morning that I would sing this simple Christian song, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And if you know the words, join me. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a 
shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt or a fear, not a sigh or a tear, can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then at fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. You know, my brothers and sisters, we've got to trust the Lord, and we got to pray for whichever candidate wins the election. We need to support them and pray for them, not criticize them. And we need <coughs> to work together for the welfare of our nation. We've got to live in peace and in justice. This is the will of God. Let your righteousness and your justice flow like a river. Thank you for joining me on this election day. I pray that the Lord will bless you, encourage you, and speak to you. And that the Lord will bless our nation, and prosper our people, so that we can live a life that is peaceful and orderly. And those of us who follow Jesus, may our lives be consistent and aligned with the perfect will of God. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of us now and forevermore. Amen. God richly bless you. Be blessed, stay blessed, but remember, you and I are called to be a blessing to others. Bye-bye. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Bye-bye.